Hello everyone. Um, this is the annual Feierbach 11 conference organized by Commons, Spilne, a journal of social criticism, a left-wing Ukrainian media about economy, politics, uh, history and culture. And this year, the topic of our conference is Dialogues of the Peripheries. Це щорічна конференція журналу «Спільне». Цього року вона, назву, вона носить назву «Діалоги периферій». Ви можете задавати питання у чаті в зумі або у коментарях під стрімами. Виступи також синхронно перекладаються з англійською на українською, навпаки. Тож заздалегідь я дякую нашим переклад... перекладачам. Um, you can ask questions in the Zoom chat or in comments below the stream on YouTube. Uh, the presentations are translated from English into Ukrainian and vice versa. So um, thanks in advance to our translators for their work. So from now, I will speak in English. Um, my name is uh, Hanna Perehoda. I'm a researcher in history and political science, uh, working on empire and nationalism. Uh, and I'm really honored to moderate our second panel, um, which is called International Insecurity, Building Solidarity in a Rupturing World. Um, Russia invasion of Ukraine exposed a crisis of international insecurity. Um, it can be described as uh, the decline of American hegemony uh, or the intensification of inter-imperialist rivalry. Uh, but as we can see, uh, this tendency leads to the threats or to the outbreaks of fighting um, all over the world from Mali to Taiwan, from Armenia to Palestine. And it is felt most act uh, acutely in uh, uh, peripheries where populations uh, have been uh, historically subject to imperial ambitions of um, so-called great powers, imperialist countries. Um, and as we see, international organizations uh, cannot uh, struggle to prevent conflicts or achieve their re uh, resolution. And uh, at the same time, progressive movements, left movements, often lack a vision of a just international order. And in addition, oppressed peoples often rely on the help of various competing in imperialist states, which makes international solidarity even more difficult. So today we will try to think beyond geopolitical logics of uh, great power politics, contributing as we can, of course, to imagine how the solidarity of the peoples who struggle against um, competing imperialisms uh, could be built in uh, 2023. And so today uh, our speakers are um, Daniel Kurt, a Palestinian political scientist, uh, she is uh, author of the book Polarized and Demobilized, Legacies of Authoritarianism in Palestine. We also have on our panel Chelsea Nyokmin-Nyen. Uh, she previously worked for the UN in Indonesia and Thailand, uh, and she was focusing on economic development and trade policy affairs in Asia. And we also have Brian Hoy, a writer, editor, translator, activist uh, from Taiwan. And uh, uh, last but not least, Volodymyr Artyuk, a Ukrainian activist, sociologist, social anthropologist uh, based in the UK. Unfortunately, Kristina uh, Solayan, a journalist from Armenia, is uh, not with us uh, today. So, um, Thanks a lot to our participants for joining us uh, today. And I'm really looking forward for this conversation. I will start with the first question. Um, 
how do you see uh, the ongoing intensification of regional conflicts and the role of the so-called great powers in, in, in those conflicts? And uh, how effective, in your opinion, have international efforts been directed at preventing or resolving or proposing resolutions uh, of the conflicts uh, in your region? So I would like uh, to start with Dana. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we're, we're going to have. I feel like I'm going to learn a lot. Um, so just to um, kind of, you know, connect what I'm about to say to um, what you were saying earlier, Hannah, um, about international insecurity and, and Ukraine being a manifestation of, of this, you know, uh, larger trend of international security. Um, I, I definitely agree that's the case. Um, but I think on the left, people should have, or it should have been more clear to everyone that this was the dynamic that was playing out, that this was going to be not uh, uh, an exception of international insecurity, but rather the, the trend is going to be international insecurity. When in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union, a number of our, these peripheries we're talking about um, continue to be oppressed, continue to not have their sovereignty uh, uh, claims met. Um, another example is when Syria was invaded by Russia. Uh, in, in 2014, 2015. So all of these manifestations of international insecurity should have, I mean, it's been ongoing and we should have been able to articulate a uh, different vision, I think, uh, uh, long before something as big as Russia invades Ukraine. And now to, to get back to um, the, the actual question. Um, so I think it's important to note that for my region, so the Middle East and North Africa region, and in particular Palestine, that international dimension and the international community, the, the failure of the international community um, has really led to the moment that we're, we're seeing both American intervention and uh, uh, other intervention. Um, so in Palestine, for example, um, international intervention and particularly American intervention pushed the Palestinians into a peace process back in, in the 1990s that disempowered them that denied them sovereignty, predicated on secret backdoor channels that didn't take public opinion or the Palestinian public opinion into account at all, um, that also actively sidelined local leadership and, and the grassroots. Um, the international intervention in the Palestine case has also created conditions of political polarization and stagnation. So in 2006, for example, the United States is, is heavily involved in overturning elections in Palestine funneling money and weapons into the outgoing party, creating uh, infighting. Um, for the last couple of decades, American and international intervention has created dynamics of hauling out civil society, criminalizing and repressing Palestinian political action, both in the Palestinian territories, as well as outside globally. Uh, so even in the global north. Um, and then within historic Palestine, imprisoning, killing or exiling any kind of political alternatives that emerge. Um, American intervention in the last couple of uh, years in particular, like since the Trump administration, has really uh, uh, been focused on sidelining Palestinians further. Specifically, I'm talking about the, um, the peace deals that the United States has been pushing for between Israel and the Arab countries that essentially completely ignores the Palestinian question. So the Abraham Accords um, was one manifestation, but even, you know, the Abraham Accords was under the um, Trump administration. So for those not familiar, the Abraham Accords with these peace deals signed between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and then eventually Morocco and Sudan as well. Um, so that was highly criticized under the Trump administration for being, um, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a framework rather than for peace, but for um, uh, basically authoritarian conflict management, et cetera. But despite the fact that Trump is no longer in office, the American foreign policy continues to pursue this as, 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 the, as the main crux of their uh, uh, Middle East policy. So President Biden, for example, has also thrown his weight behind these normalization deals, these peace deals that completely sideline and skip over Palestinians and what they want. Um, and today, with the current crisis, the current assault on Gaza, the lack of ceasefire, the fact that the Israeli government has unclear objectives, 
the, the basically the entire dynamic that we're seeing that has led to over 10,000 Palestinians to be killed in the past few weeks, it's all co-signed and assisted by American uh, intervention and and, um, and 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 Western intervention uh, particularly. Now I'm focused, of course, on the, the American because I'm talking about Palestine. Also, I apologize if you hear any background noise. <laughs> My child is yelling in the background. Um, so I'm focused on the United States because I'm speaking about Palestine. But if I were to kind of zoom out um, and discuss um, the broader region, um, and this this applies to Palestine as well, but other types of international intervention, other sources of international intervention. So Iran or Russia, for example, has not been any better. It has increased levels of violence. It has weaponized uh, um, these causes in a way. So um, we can, you know, in the Q and A for for instance, if people are interested, we can talk about the Syrian example or the Lebanese example or Iranian intervention in any and all of these um, uh, and, and Russian intervention in any and all of these because um, what we find in the Middle East is no international intervention has been useful uh, um, for um, you know, constraining states or uh, upholding international human rights law or, or anything of that nature. Um, and and uh, that's, you know, the fact that a Russia can do this maybe um, is expected, but um, when American or Western intervention is really similar, uh, uh, there's no distinction between its 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 negative impacts. Uh, in fact, it might be worse. Um, this is uh, you know this bodes poorly for the kind of international system that um, we would want to build that can kind of uphold uh, uh, human rights and and and, and dignity. Um, I think I'll leave it there and we can talk more in, in the Q&A. Thank you, Dana. Um, I would like to continue with Brian. Brian, please. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so to get into that question, first, I would like to echo Dana's comments that I think it's true that on the left, we have historically lacked this kind of internationalism, which are generally the discussing and considering solutions and how to fit together various disparate struggles and framework. And so that's why when these things happened, it seems like the left is often caught off guard. And honestly, I think that just speaks to the lack of attention paid to the world as a whole, rather than zooming in on these specific places. And so I think these dialogues are very necessary. And so I'm very grateful to comments for organizing this. Uh, though that's the thing, actually, it's, it should be, there should be more common dialogues of this sort. Um, so discuss Taiwan. Taiwan is caught between the US and China, and they are caught in a pattern of escalation against each other at present. And Taiwan is wedged uncomfortably between the two. Uh, China often will direct military threats at Taiwan. Uh, just two days ago, there were 40 warplanes in Taiwan's air defense identification zone. Uh, it's not a, a it's a kind of an odd situation in which both sides perceive themselves as only responding to the other, the US and China. But I think often on the left, there's a tendency to zoom in only on the US and its actions as a provocateur, when I think it's actually the case that China is more of an aggressor here. Uh, for example, when Chinese officials visited Taiwan in previous political administrations, it's not as the US then military threatened Taiwan. But on the other hand, when last year, US Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, then China launches a set of unprecedented military exercises directed at Taiwan. And so uh, the way in which uh, the Taiwan has this relation to the US is that Taiwan is historically dependent on the US for security, uh, and that has proven a challenge. Uh, for example, there are periods in which the U.S. seemed not to care as much about Taiwan or wanted Taiwan to just sort of disappear off the map because it's inconvenient for its broader regional stratagems. Taiwan is seen as a provocative, for example, sticking itself up too much in favor of preserving its de facto independence from China. Uh, the PRC has never ruled Taiwan in 70-odd years of existence. Uh, and then thinking of Taiwan as a troublemaker. But now we live in a moment in which, for example, the U.S. is really backing Taiwan as a way to stick it to China. And these are often right-wing actors that are using this. Uh, during the Trump administration, one saw the stepping up of support for Taiwan as trade tensions with China intensify, but also the uh, U.S.-China tech war. And Taiwan as, for example, the manufacturer of 90% of the world's advanced semiconductors and 65% of global supply is caught in between in this tech war. Uh, and then particularly now, after the Trump administration, one has these former Trump administration has-beens, U.S. politicians that want to run for president, perhaps, and will travel to Taiwan as a way to remain in the spotlight. 
Uh, but then I think that neglects the fact that, for example, the U.S. backed the KMT in Taiwan for decades. The authoritarian rule of the Chinese Nationalist Party also has KMT, which fits the classic pattern of when the U.S. backs these right-wing authoritarian dictatorships in the interest of anti-communism, which in this case is directed at China. And the party that's currently in power is the Democratic Progressive Party, which is not really progressive, it's rather neoliberal, but it's a central left party and does have some elements of progressive social policy. And it emerged from the democratization movement. So that's the political forces in power. And it is now aligned with the US, which formerly backed its adversary, the KMT, the former authoritarian party, which is still around. And even as recently as 2012, for example, the US tried to sabotage the DPP's presidential campaign through a phone call placed from the White House to the Financial Times, saying that we don't have faith in Tsai Ing-wen, the current, who is actually the current president uh, of the DPP and of Taiwan, to stand up to China. And so I think this gets neglected on the left. There's just this reductive view of Taiwan then sometimes as though it was just a puff of the U.S. and that uh, it's just the same as the KMT decades ago, as though this uh, this this uh, view of history of Taiwan then has not been updated for the left. And so Taiwan then is caught between two, but there's also these military actions from China. Uh, China will try to undermine Taiwan's elections. There's economic pressure applied to Taiwan. And there's kidnapping of human rights activists, for example, that are Taiwanese that maybe pass through China uh, just to visit friends or family, etc. Uh, there's also gang-related violence in Taiwan that occurs because of their connections with China. Uh, they're occurring, uh, they're acting on behalf of the uh, CCP's political views in Taiwan, uh, and there may be direct connections with the Chinese government. And so there's a number of factors at play here, and Taiwan is caught between them. So thinking its way out is a, is a difficult challenge, but I think that's uh, something we should talk about, and I'm very excited to discuss further on that and have it here and also save it for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, Chelsea, please. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for the interventions by Dana and Brian. Um, and I would like to continue from them as well. Um, from the point of view of Vietnam, I speak from a lot of from the position with a lot of contradictions because formally speaking, Vietnam is a country ruled by formerly ruled by a communist party, um, but it has its most intense geopolitical disputes with another country, which is also ruled by a communist party, namely China. And uh, this was this was a fallout that intensified during the later two decades of the 21st century Cold War, in which the meltdown in socialist internationalism globally was most violently manifested between uh, China and Vietnam. And this year has been um, a year of contradictions between China and Vietnam as well. On, on the, in one hand, you have um, continuing um, maritime disputes uh, between the two countries in the South China Sea. Um, in May this year, you um, Vietnam had to go through a one month intense standoff with China when um, Chinese vessels uh, decided to harass um, oil and gas fields within Vietnam's legitimate economic uh, economic um, uh, exclusive economic zone. Um, and these gas in these oil and gas fields are also um, managed jointly with Russia. And uh, during this standoff, um, Vietnam invited uh, Russia's, um, I think the, the party leader of United Russia, Dmitry Medvedev, uh, to visit Hanoi in order to potentially intervene and to ask the Chinese to um, withdraw from the oil and gas fields. And uh, following this visit, um, no, um, not much change happened. Uh, that's why it happened for one month. Uh, and during this visit, um, Ch uh, Russia also formally asked Vietnam to uh, join a formal um, coalition called, I, I forgot the formal name of it, but it's something about combating neocolonialism in response to, um, you know, Russia's invasion of U Ukraine that it sees as, you know, a fight against not exactly Ukraine, but the whole entire West. And uh, Vietnam didn't respond to it, which means that it actually rejected the invitation. Uh, and why is Russia so essential, which is also another point of contradiction from where I speak. Uh, Russia is Vietnam's most important and traditional 
uh, military alive, so dating back from the Cold War. It's also one of the reasons why Vietnam is officially neutral um, over the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, but beneath that neutrality, there is um, there's uh, there are many diplomats and government officials who feel deeply disturbed by um, Russia's attack on Ukraine. For instance, the um, Vietnam's Prime Minister Phan Minh Chin, he met uh, Ukraine's President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky on the sidelines of the G7 meeting in Hiroshima um, in May this year. And he's the only head of state of a communist party run country to have met Zelensky, which is quite significant. However, the However, the lack of um, actual substance in terms of support for Ukraine. Um, you have um, you have business communities and also civil society communities who have um, voiced um, voiced their very loud opposition to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But um, what am I going to say now is it relates to the left's weakness when it comes to the foreign policy in general. It's not exactly unique to Vietnam uh, because of all policy areas um, that you know the left and generally all general populations around the world um, try to uh, shape their outcomes. Foreign policy is among the most undemocratic policy areas for anyone for any ordinary citizen to intervene and it's also this policy area in which you know the essence the, the manifestation of citizenship like try to you know voice opinions and shape outcomes is the most difficult and uh this is especially pertinent in vietnam i mean it's it's not an electoral democracy and foreign and it's very difficult to change the foreign policy directions of the Communist Party and the government because it's seen as the most you know, sensitive area. Uh, but this is also to do with Vietnam's own traumatic experience during the Cold War. Um, it jumped from various formal alliances with great powers. With, uh, for example, um, when Vietnam was divided between North and South, the South Vietnamese alliance with the United States ended traumatically and ended with you know, the collapse of South Vietnamese as a nation state. And then with North Vietnam and later the unified communist Vietnam, um, their former alliances with China and later on the Soviet Union led to you know, wars with you know, Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, a border war with China that lasted for 10 years. Um, and you know, loss of um, uh, loss of islands to China as well. And uh, during the later years of the 1980s, um, Vietnam more or less felt abandoned by the Soviet Union, even though the Soviet Union was um, essential for its survival while the United States was sanctioning Vietnam for 20 years after it militarily withdrew from Vietnam in 1973. Uh, and, and within the Soviet Union, Ukraine was essential. I mean, especially in terms of you no know, uh, crops, exports, uh, food assistance, education assistance, and many other kinds of support. So, again, the neutrality between neutrality towards Russia's invasion of Ukraine it, it, it's a very difficult position because both Russia and Ukraine in the past helped Vietnam tremendously. And uh, myself, I speak from a position in which. Uh, I'm vehemently opposed to Russian invasion, but I speak from a very difficult position because I'm. I, I have to be honest. I have to self-censor myself quite, quite a lot as well. So, uh, which is one of the reasons I decided to join this panel because in other um, public forums, especially directly related to the UN, um, I cannot speak like this. Uh, so, that's my opinion. Um, thank you a lot for um, for this and thank you for being um, honest with us and also we value a lot your uh, participation and your perspective, which is, uh, I think, for Ukraine, one of the least known, the um, uh, Southeastern Asian perspective, but one of the most important, I think, also. Uh, Volodya, please, uh, it's your turn.
Thank you, Anna. Uh, so um, I will uh, start with, uh, with a sort of recap of what I earlier said about the, uh, the causes of the uh, war uh, between Russia and Ukraine and then try to situate the uh, what's happening now with this war in the broader um, uh, global uh, situation. Um, I said earlier that uh, this war um, was not defensive on uh, uh, Russia's um, on Russia's part. Uh, it was, but it was a it was reaction. Mm, it was a it's a violent and aggressive reaction and reaction to what and I think answering this question is is quite is quite important both to the left and to to a more general understanding of the current conjuncture. So uh, American historical sociologist Michael Mann wrote a book in two thousand three which he called an incoherent empire. So that was an early reaction to the American invasion in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And the major claim there was that the US imperialism is, uh, is a harsh um, militaristic imperialism. But uh, it's, uh, the US always tries to sustain its uh, hegemonic rule, the rule by, uh, by persuasion, by economic coercion, by systematic military interventions. But all these interventions are always incoherent, uh, both because they are extremely unsuccessful, uh, despite the America's huge uh, un unmatched military budget it almost, it very rarely achieves even military success in, in cases of its inter intervention. But most importantly, the, uh, the political consequences of the interventions are more often than not directly opposed to what was planned, if there are any uh, traceable plans. Uh, the interventions don't patch up the uh, whatever global world order American elite imagines, but uh, tears it apart even more uh, violently, as uh, many of the previous speakers said. And so at, at this moment, 2003, uh, it was not yet clear what's going to come out of the, uh, the new uh, American century. And now we live at the end of that, uh, of that American century, and we are starting to see the the results uh, at the the what many people call the decline of American hegemony is precipitating, mm -hmm. and this decline is visible uh, obviously not not only in uh, the uh, increasing frequency of uh, the conflicts uh, but also in uh, economic disarray and most importantly in uh, the conflicts within the American elite because uh, the global hegemony is, can be viewed as an extension of the uh, hegemonic processes in the country itself. Uh, so why, why, do we see, uh, why, why do we see this manifesting in, 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 in so many conflicts? Uh, it's uh, quite simple to see because the wars start most of the time because the, the rulers feel weakness in the enemy. Uh, they feel overconfident. Uh, they overestimate their chances. And, and they persuade themselves uh, and their uh, close elite circles that the war going to war is going to bring uh, is going to bring them uh, success. Usually, uh, usually it doesn't happen. Zooming in towards to the stage at which the Rus Russian Ukrainian war is now, uh, we we see we see this uh, this moment uh, this moment of a stalemate as it has 
recently been said aloud. Uh, the stalemate was uh, was the concept that was that was floating on on the internet, but uh, now we see a flurry of statements from uh, all sorts of officials, both the Ukrainian and American, that to the effect that uh, Ukraine's uh, recent offensive or counteroffensive uh, didn't lead to the to any uh, considerable results and that uh, the baseline scenario of this war is, is a grinding stalemate, a war of attrition, and it's uh, going to be a war of uh, resources. A war of resources, which will require the US to continue and to underwrite the uh, delivery of weapons and uh, economic assistance. But exactly at this point, when it's necessary, the internal contradictions of the American ruling elite and uh, the political processes in Europe are not uh, beneficial to this. So we see that in this point in the Ukrainian war, the whole tragedy of the American century, century is playing out forcefully. Uh, doesn't transpire that the U.S. has any clear plan of supporting of, of where its support of Ukraine will lead to, and it doesn't seem that in the crucial moment uh, anyone can come up with this plan. Uh, now, all the decision making is being explicitly pushed to uh, the Ukrainian government and military leadership, which in itself breeds contradiction in Ukrainian politics. So we see a set of failures that that uh, merge, that breed each other and merge into each other. Um, and uh, I, I see um, I see similar processes uh, happening in in other cases that that have been mentioned today. I see the dynamic between the U.S. and Israel is this dynamic of lack of leadership and failure that. Fail, failure of planning that is being patched up by the crude military force that without any clear 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 idea was what's going to happen next uh, so yeah i'm going to finish here uh, as, as an initial uh, an initial thesis that I, I i think i will try to develop later thank you thanks a lot um thank you and i will uh, continue with my second question and the second uh, question is, is there, in your opinion, um, a potential of reforming the existing international organizations like the United States or the African Union, uh, etc.? cetera? Because, um, well, they claim uh, to provide an equal representation for all member states, but we know that they are very structured with all the imbalances in power, um, also in influence. Uh, this structure can disproportionately serve the interests of major powers. And uh, in general, should the progressive movements, the left movements engage with these institutions at all, or we should privilege our grassroots activities without um, um, yeah, without engaging with these huge institutionalist monsters. Um, I would like to, to start with uh, Chelsea, given her professional experience, I would uh, really uh, like to know your opinion. Thank you, Hannah. Um, from the institutional monsterish level that you mentioned, I will start from there. Um, there have been two major attempts of reforms in the past eight years. The first reform is um, a proposal um, which was um, initiated by France and Mexico in 2015 about um, um, denying the uh, P5, uh, the, the five uh, veto powers in the UN Security Council to not use the veto power in a face of abject um, crime, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, um, and ethnic cleansing slash uh, genocide. And um, this 
proposal has been widely discussed internally within the UN uh, and, and it gained um, galvanizing support uh, following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So by July, 2022, um, it had received um, some, no approval by 106 uh, member states. Um, predictably, with the exception of you know, countries as the United States, the United Kingdom, um, etc. Uh, so, and um, in the face of the latest Israeli-Palestinian escalations, um, we see the contradictions in this proposal by the very countries that initiated it, this proposal to begin with, France. Um, in spite of the the differences geopolitically and in terms of national interests between, let's say, France and Russia at the moment, um, on October 16, when um, Russia um, proposed uh, an immediate humanitarian um, ceasefire uh, in the Gaza Strip. Um, it was blocked by the United Kingdom, France, Japan, and the United States. And then the following day was the um, the horrific bombing of the Al Ali Baptist Hospital, which led to the day after when the, a more dilutedly worded proposal um, uh, by Brazil uh, was presented at the UN Security Council, um, which did not ask for a ceasefire but a humanitarian some corridor for humanitarian aid. Um, it was supported by France and Japan, and the United Kingdom decided to abstain. So the only country that blocked the resolution was the United States. Um, and why do I say, like, regardless of the geopolitical differences between um, uh, France and Russia, I mean, as of since yesterday, uh, the UN Office of Human Rights have, uh, have released two reports raising the alarm of an abject genocide happening in the, across the occupied Palestinian territories. So this is a very clear, increasingly clear, not finally clear, but increasingly clear case of an abject, potential abject war crime, crime against humanity and um, ethnic cleansing slash genocide. So you see this competing and clashing um, interests between the great powers of the world in spite of this generally constructive proposals for reform of the UN Security Council uh, being pushed forward. Secondly, is the, 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 the push to expand the, mem the, the number of permanent members in the UN Security Council. Um, this has been pushed most vigorously by India because um, unlike in the past, in the 50s and 60s, when it's, when it supported China to be the permanent permanent member in the UNSC. Um, now he wants a seat. And it's um and it's you know not formal application yet, but it's bait it's being supported by major Western powers, uh United States, United Kingdom, Germany, Brazil. And Brazil is also among the countries that also bidding for a permanent seat in the UNSC. But it's very difficult because uh, again in this particular um reform uh, area uh, the the admission of India into the UNSC is being blocked by another major power in the global south, China. Uh, it's being vigorously blocked by China. And this year, India held the G20 summit. And throughout the summit, there were so many differences and over petty things between India and China to the point that um, there seems to be no point of return in the bilateral relations between India and China at the moment, which, you know, is you know, another manifest manifestation of how, you know, the global south itself internally, you know, it's despite its wide diversities of politics uh, and whatever, um, it's deeply divided. And um, so that was from institutional monsterish level. Now at the grassroots level, um, you know, from working for many years within UN institutions, um, what I see is that these institutions are stacked with goodwill people, like people who generally want to, you know, um, uh, reform the UN and make it more accessible to grassroots organizations and to make a genuine impact on the ground. But uh, I will be very honest, uh, at this point, um, Many governments, not just this P 
people inside this UN institutions, they are more or less um, concluding that perhaps the UN is not reformable. It's not, it's not just a matter of itself being big, uh, but no, the, the clashing interests between the great powers are so wide to the point that there's no subjectivity and agency for people on the ground to make an impact. And I mean, uh, the UN itself has a responsibility. I mean, uh, in my opinion, um, the impacts, like, the impacts that are being made on the ground, let's say from all the way from the sustainable development goals to um, you know, preventing you know, abject uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing slash genocide, uh, it's, it's not being fulfilled. I mean, I just I think, I think a few days ago, there was the director of the UN Office of Human Rights in New York City who, who um, stepped down after 30 years. And his, and his letter was damning and very true that you know, the UN has failed to, to, to intervene and to stop you know, wars and conflicts around the world. And um, I think now is really a, 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 a suitable time to think of alternative ways to make an impact. And I think, I think also during the first few months after Russia invaded Ukraine, there was tremendous criticism on the ground by various Ukrainian civil society organizations about how, how indifferent or ineffective you know, UN organizations were in you know, alleviating the humanitarian uh, crisis that unfolded across Ukraine at the time. And I really sympathize with that because it is generally true. And, and it's, it's, it's really a time for um, retrospection uh, by the leadership in the UN as well. Sometimes they are generally out of touch. And um, we sh you know the left or uh, progressive movements should not internalize too much their own weaknesses. Uh, sometimes it's really to do with you know, external circumstances that we cannot change at all. And um, so um, sometimes impact can be made uh, more substantively um, outside the UN organizations. And um, I'm increasingly convinced by that personally. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, I maybe I would like to ask the other participants if they would like to react for, uh, to what just Chelsea said. Uh, please raise your hand. <laughs> Yeah, Dana. If Brian would like to go first, please feel free. Um, no, you can go first. I can go after. Okay. <laughs> I mean, um, the, I, I obviously do not have like, like, thank you so much for your perspective, Chelsea. Like this, this, you know, you have such a rich understanding of the internal mechanisms and and a real clear view of of how this works. Um, what I was going to say to this question, like everything that you mentioned, resonated even. To the you know about how the UN um, certain UN agencies fail in these times of crisis. So there's been a lot of critique from the Palestinian side about the UN RWA UNRWA and how they've been um, reacting to um, the assault in in Gaza. Um, but then I think about I think about the UN as this system that emerges after the World War II, uh, supposedly for collective security. Um, and and to provide safeguards against state impunity. And the problem is, as you you know, all the problems you mentioned, there's these, um, the global South is very authoritarian. It has these divisions. And of course, when there are these safeguards, they work selectively because it is, you know, the UN is structurally flawed. You know, there's the Security Council, it was a huge role for American hegemony and things like this. But at the same time, I'm wondering, like, we know that institutions are, like political scientists say, institutions are sticky. Um, so, we, I mean, I, I'm not suggesting that our theory of change should flow through such institutions by any shape or form, or that like, you know, if we have a hundred percent effort, even 10% should go to the UN. But I wonder if it's not also, it's not also, um, perhaps damaging to say we, we don't engage at all, you know, um, because we want to try to push to expand the scope of these institutions to make them more robust. Because I think about, like, if that wasn't a worthwhile effort, even, even again, not, not the bulk of our effort, but even a little bit of effort, uh, I think about how the Israeli government has spent so much effort trying to keep Palestine out of the, out of the International Criminal Court. 
um, and that it, it did seem to them like a very significant impact on 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 the international system. So, you know, I just wonder how we weigh something like that. Um, and then I guess finally, like, I think about the world we envision, like what precedent is being set. So our issue, I think everyone here is in agreement, our issue is that we don't want a world where might is right, where states are unconstrained, where they can ignore human rights law, where they can expel people. Expulsion has become you know, really the name of the game in Artsakh, in, 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 in parts of Ukraine, in, in Palestine, where all of that becomes the, you know, the process by which states behave and where you know, sovereign nations like Ukraine can be invaded. But the reason we don't want that is not because we just happen to dislike who's engaging in that. Like we disagree with this world because we happen to dislike the United States or you know, whatever actors engaging in that. We, we want to constrain authoritarian power and state violence generally. And so I'm wondering how much like the stated objectives of the UN can be worked with, even if maybe right now, um, as you mentioned, there are all these tensions. Of course, again, the theory of change, whether that goes through the UN or whether we start reforming domestic politics in the global south is a different matter. And, and it's, a, it's a big question. But yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Brian. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I echo that as well. I think um, what's quite interesting is that on the left, particularly, we, I think it's a kind of reform or revolution question in some sense that we, in some way, do want to reform the existing institutions, but we want different institutions, better institutions, alternatives that are not, at the end of the day, instruments for state power in which they have come to this collective body or into it because they believe they can further their interests as states through that. And so, I mean, for Taiwan, there's long been the desire to enter the UN because Taiwan excluded. But I think oftentimes there's a very liberal imagination that that is quite occluding, actually. That's the desire for recognition, but you just want access to the club of powerful states. And there are real world effects, such as being denied part of the health, World Health Organization. Uh, information regarding COVID, for example, Taiwan didn't have as much compared to other countries when the pandemic started. But then at the end of the day, I mean, Taiwan is often seeking joining uh, these regional trade blocs like the CPTPP or military security dialogues like the Quad. And what happened then? I mean, it, Taiwan becomes part of the securitization of the region. Or you join a trade block in the CPTP, what are the impact on Taiwanese farmers? Uh, we saw the impact decades ago of free trade agreements and, and so forth. Or AUKUS and uh, the U.S. military presence in the Asia Pacific. And Taiwan banks on strengthening those ties as a bulwark against China. But what about the kind of regional security or these tensions in the region? And so I think that's uh, the real question then, because particularly in at least the Asia Pacific, another major regional bloc is ASEAN. The alliance of uh, Southeast Asian nations. And Taiwan is not a member, but there's a lot of economic engagement and talk of strengthening that to kind of counter the threat of China. But what does that mean in terms of economically uh, de incentivizing Taiwanese companies from being so reliant on China so you can exploit Southeast Asian workers? And that's how you get away from this economic pressure from China on you or military ties. Um, and then when you look at ASEAN, it's also one of these bodies that doesn't say anything about the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingyas in Myanmar, for example, or the civil war that goes on there, where airstrikes are being carried on, uh, on uh, uh, with such frequency that's on par with Ukraine against civilian populations. And so I think that points to something about the nature of these international institutions, but then how we as leftists want to push for reform, but also to go beyond. I think keeping that both in mind, and that's not an either or question, I think is quite crucial, but then without just channeling efforts entirely into one avenue or the other uh, in that sense. Volodya, do you want to add something to this? Uh, yeah, briefly, I uh, uh, think I agree with the uh, previous uh, speakers. I just want to note that um probably the, the um so what's what, what's happening now and why it's dangerous is uh, is this vision of uh, international frameworks not not on the un but uh, other pre-existing blocks like uh, the uh, russia lead uh, uh security cooperation organization and, and so on they are all um being subverted in uh, favor of uh, projected or emerging coalitions or bilate bilateral uh, bilateral alliances, and um, this is what's happening. And the nature of the Russian-Ukrainian war is um, um, it's a bit exceptional, I would say, in the sense that um, Russia 
claims in this war a sort of a messi messianic nation of reforming the global order and it closely mimics the uh, American behavior uh, in, in Iraq in a sense that it uh, asserts its sovereignty, its sovereignty in, in a sense of um, exceptional right, exceptional right of might yet yeah, to, to reform stuff. But again, uh, yeah, it's it's really bad. It, it's terrible. But even worse than that, Russia in doing so in trying to live up to the role of a global sovereign, uh, it fails miserably at its own uh, at its own project of of uh, regulating anything in its vicinity, and uh, we see that uh, Russia's. Uh, track records in, in Syria and recently in uh, Karabakh, uh, Artsakh has been terrible. So what's happening is this, uh, the subversion of the previous pre-existing uh, global institutions and the complete uh, inability to build anything new. Uh, and that's, that, that's quite concerning. So yeah, uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's enough for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, fortunately, it's not our last question, so we, we are not ending with this quite pessimistic uh, um, diagnosis of, of what is happening, but I would like also to open our discussion on a, on a, on a, on a possible, how can we possibly to imagine a strategy? How do you see a progressive strategy of facing this ongoing crisis of security, um, how to build international solidarity in opposition to this logic of geopolitical blocks. Of course, this is a very huge question, And uh, uh, but if today we can at least start to share some elements of our understanding of our ideas, I think it would be already uh, yeah, a good beginning. Uh, so I would like to start with Brian. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, particularly as we've kind of alluded to in the discussion, I think we as people have to rely on each other as movements, as leftists, rather than on states. And so, uh, but then I think oftentimes, at least in my home context, when I say, for example, well, we should stand support with Palestine, it becomes this kind of, you know, cost benefit response where what can we get out of that? Uh, Palestine cannot provide economically or militarily or whatever to Taiwan the way Israel can. Uh, and so then there's that question. And recently in the past year, the Taiwanese people are very focused on Ukraine as an example of successful warfare. And I also don't think that's the point that we, the point is not to learn lessons from fending off China militarily, but the solidarity of peoples. Uh, and so that's the question then, how can we actually work together? Because I think oftentimes we do as leftists uh, express solidarity towards each other, but very rarely translates towards material support. Uh, we draw support and legitimacy from each other uh, in the way that, for example, when you do see movements popping up, authoritarian states often will claim that, well, let's see, behind that is some insidious color revolution and so forth. And activists can build connections. And well, there's no need to feel delegitimized because there are these genuine ways we learn from each other. It's not some conspiracy because we're actually drawing power from each other. But then I think that particularly when we're up against the forces of global capital, and of these states, which uh, create the conditions for capital to continue to exist, it's already transnational in nature. And sometimes states learn from each other, and uh, there are these institutions for them to really strengthen each other regionally and so forth. And so I think we live in an era in which just there is not the international that is capable of dealing with global capitalism at present. And so we need to think of ways to do that. Uh, I think oftentimes in the past, I don't know, a few decades, because there's a failure of the broad internationalism, we have this turn towards regionalisms. But I think there's also that's also in itself leads to some issues. I think we need to really draw these connections across places, but then think about what is more going beyond that than is offering solidarity. How can we actually learn from each other, but then think of ourselves as part of a larger shared struggle? And I think that's the only way we can overcome the challenges that face all of us. Thank you. Thank you. I would like um, just to remind to uh, our um, those who are present in our chat on Zoom and who are following us on YouTube, you can post your questions uh, into the chat. Um, so, and I hope we will have um, 
a few minutes to 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 discuss these questions. Um, so, Valodia, can you can you continue on this? Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's uh, the hardest question. Um, I think we are not here for answers. I I think uh, that's. Uh, it's too hard a challenge. Uh, I would draw attention probably. Uh, okay, so there are three levels. We have knowledge production, the institutional cooperation, and the collective action in, in some domains. Mm, and I think as paradoxically as it is, the level of cooperation somehow works uh, simply because we managed to get together uh, and talk uh, somehow and uh, we even managed to sign letters and so on uh, but I would say uh, it is expected from the left to, uh, to yeah to think and talk more than to than to act uh, because they, they lack power but I think there is a problem also in, in the sphere of knowledge production uh, too and uh, mm, that 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 was uh, that's what I see around around me is that uh, the terrible drastic fragmentation uh, of the left that happens after every uh, conflict it uh, it in a way mimics uh, mimics the dynamic of the uh, mainstream intellectuals uh, in, in in the in the world that is uh, that is fragmenting it, it, it's visible that we ourselves are mm, losing the capability to offer Mm, not 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 only precepts, not not only vision of the future, but also the basic uh, analysis of, of of the situation in front of us. And this analysis should not be limited to single uh, single people expressing their opinions or citing their works, but. Uh, 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 establishing also knowledge production cooperation and. What I see there in, in, uh, on the level of uh, universe, the academia, the, uh, uh, alternative um, intellectual platforms is um, the lack of new, uh, the lack of analysis that would be commensurable with the conjuncture. We, we, we repeat the, the cliches that, that we developed. We uh, jump on bandwagons. Um, that's... Uh, that probably is good that we still do it because that's that's something. Uh, um, but I think that the, the there is a severe severe problem uh, with uh, with the analysis with the with the theoretical analysis. Uh, I, I I don't know. I, uh, um, I yeah. If if we have time, we could also touch upon this uh, in, in, in a bit. Um, Chelsea? Yeah, uh, let me first continue with Dana's point about the UN. Uh, I actually agree with her and I would like to clarify with myself a little bit bes beside my you know, realistic pessimism about you know, uh, the UN's capacity to drive change alongside progressive movements um, in recent years and nowadays. I think because um, from a legal perspective, um, I would say many countries in the global south who are entangled in, you know, uh, territorial disputes or wars or conflicts, especially con um, concerning, you know, uh, statehood, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. Uh, um, you know, in spite of the limitations of, you know, U.S. unipolarity, um, many of these countries still insist on clinging to the international laws uh, based on the UN um, system uh, in order to assert themselves, their own legitimacy um, internationally. Um, you have it with the Palestinians. I mean, the only way, I mean, uh, beyond the UN system itself, there is no other way presently that the Palestinians realistically can uh, realize their their legitimate right for statehood and self determination. Um, it's the same with Ukraine. Um, despite the limitations on the ground uh, from a humanitarian perspective by the UN, from a legal perspective, um, the UN system is still the only 
viable way for itself to assert itself as you know a victim of Russian territorial encroachments. Um, and um, it's the same with Vietnam um, in its own maritime disputes with China in the South China Sea. Um, in spite of Vietnam's very difficult historical uh, difficult relationship with the UN historically uh, dur during the Cold War, at the moment, it prefers the international legal system as led by the UN in favor of an alternative world that is actually emerging that of you know imperial irredentism no no um, nostalgia for further territorial encroachments in the realization of you know so-called uh, glorious past civilizations like the russian world or uh, chinese world i don't know what specifically it's called but especially when it comes to china it feels very um intimate for vietnam from a national security perspective and as for um, the outlook for progressive change, um, again, um, I think what the issue with the left is one thing is vision. Another thing is a reality that in order to execute a certain vision for a progressive foreign policy or an internationalist one, you need political power through political parties or through in any way to you know gain a, a state power so that you can actually execute your vision and i think that's where that's the trap of the left at the moment because you see a lot of you know leftists they they in pursuit of power in order to in order to execute their final vision for foreign policy or whatever they end up being becoming state apologists in the process and they end up um dismissing you know genuine suffering that many people go through in the process for example with a civil war in syria uh, you have many leftists supporting the assad government uh, regardless of you know no abject evidences that you know it's not uh, it's not uh, all too bad and evil here like uh, uh, you know, governments in the global south are not always right. And that's true, especially in the current age, compared to, you know, during the, between 1945 till 1980s, you know, many countries in the global south, you know, had leaders, had intellectuals, uh, and ordinary citizens with genuine intellectual and grand visions for a progressive world. Um, they were driven by moralistic imperatives, irrespective of their limitation. Whereas nowadays, I cannot find, I cannot uh, point out a single state leader in a global South who actually think about deep questions for an alternative progressive world. It's nowadays it's more about, you know, cynical geopolitical calculations, cynical positioning of where one stands, you know, in the geopolitical game between great powers in which, you know, a kind of neutrality void of much um, political progressive content is being celebrated. It's safe position, yes, but it, it, it leaves us nowhere. It's more like a, it's more like a reactive rather than something of an agency to push for uh, no, an alternative beyond you know U.S. or Western unipolarity. So it's, it's it's so this puzzle between vision and the pursuit of power to execute the vision is what I think the left has a tendency to you know go in so many different directions, often in a very brutal uh, way to the detriment of you know millions of people. You see it in Syria. You see it in Ukraine. Um, perhaps to a less extent with the Israeli-Palestinian escalations where you have this, I think the left is more or less united behind Palestine, but I am definitely with Palestine, but you know, within this movement, you have voices that, you know, have not been so supportive to, you know, Ukraine's own self-determination, um, you know, progressive movements in Syria and other parts in the Middle East. So, um, what I fear after all these horror shows happening around the world is ending is that, you know, genuine human rights violations, abject crime, war crimes or genocide 
the denial of search is going to be rife because uh because um as we see in in Israel Palestine now the the polarization between two or more different camps is getting more intense and um it's it's a matter of compliance rather than let's say the stated objectives of institutions like the UN which i think many people around the world widely consent on thank you thank you so much uh chelsea uh dana please to your turn yeah um i just want to say thank you to to everyone um for our, um such a interesting view um and and especially to, to chelsea for kind of outlining it so clearly the vision versus the lack of power um i think that that's very on point um i just want to i i guess i'll be very brief but because everything is is has been so well articulated already but um i want to go back to brian's point about you know solidarities with people and that you know we should care about what's happening everywhere i mean obviously like there needs to be a moral underpinning for why that's the case. I mean, that's the, the left claims to have this moral underpinning that they they don't want oppression and, and they don't want inequality and all of these things. But I mean, even as, you know, on top of that moral underpinning, like this is a strategic issue. What happens in Syria impacted Ukraine, and what happens in Ukraine will impact Palestine and vice versa. You know, so the the precedent we're setting for the world is we're all gonna face it. We're all gonna become less safe um so so i think i mean in terms of like what we do i do think we have an issue with information and we have an issue as 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 was already mentioned with theoretical analysis so i think that's the first step is to meet to practice solidarity and to educate so these kinds of these kinds of uh, uh meetings that break that campus polarization where you see uh, you know, a Ukrainian solidarity with the Palestinian people, and you see, you know, people from different positionalities um, discussing these things. I think this is very important. Like, where we're we're demonstrating an alternative vision just by doing something like this, and then also aligning goals and strategies um, in our individual sphere, like aligning them across different domestic spheres. So, in particular, I'm thinking about because I'm a Palestinian, but I live in the United States. Um, if we're interested in progressive foreign policy in our domestic sphere especially in like the global north or in countries where as as limited as as it is we do have some impact on policy um then we can connect like with activists and the working class and other parts of the world to develop our stance on these issues we don't have to guess <laughs> you know the the there was like these quote unquote peace protests in germany for example peace because they want the ceasefire between ukraine and russia I mean, where is the, you know, what is this left doing? Ask Ukrainians what they want, you know, ask Ukrainians if they want this kind of ceasefire and ask Palestinians and ask Taiwanese people and, you know, align these goals and strategies so that they can develop the progressive foreign policy. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a long road in, you know, in these, in these domestic spaces to articulate that progressive foreign policy, get people on board, try to build power, etc. But the, I think there are obviously more opportunities in imperfect democratic systems than there are in other places to to push that so i um you know from my positionality that's what i think about um and then yeah i, th I guess the last thing i'd say like just to keep it really brief is that like our enemies learn from each other authoritarian forces learn from each other they coordinate with each other on surveillance on repression on military uh, dominance so we must also learn from each other Mm, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for all these perspectives and this question. Um, I feel like uh, it is very important for all of us of how we are trying on our level to articulate um, the demands for um, political efficacy, but also moral uh, integrity in this uh, very <laughs> complicated world of uh, geopolitical games that we have no control upon. Um, I have a question in the chat, and I think um, it is a question for Dana, if I understand well. Uh, could you elaborate on the position of uh, Ukrainian left in the Israel-Palestine conflict? 
referring to the last question to the last question about the grassroots solidarity and the pragmatic of sticky institutions and self-positioning in the global perspective. I think maybe it could be a question for Volodya and also for Dana, like both perspectives are welcome. So Volodya, uh, let's start with you. The question is in the chat. If Fortunately, I don't see it for some reason, just a second. Uh, so it's the, the question about the position of, of the Ukrainian left. Ukrainian left in the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah. yeah, please go uh, on. Well, we mm, can uh, read obviously the uh, letter of solidarity with the Palestinian people that's been published on uh, Commons, and uh, uh, you can read some other interventions. Um, the problem is, uh, I mean, there, there is obviously uh, the uh, the solidarity based on empathy and uh, based on humanitarian concerns. Unfortunately, there hasn't been a sustained uh, political debate among uh, among the Ukrainian left or or, or across uh, uh, our uh, allies uh, simply because of the extremely suffocating uh, ideological and political climate. The Letter of Solidarity that was published on Commons was immediately attacked. Uh, was a DDoS attack, uh, and it wasn't. It was possible to to uh, to reach it for for days, and uh, the debates uh, the debates become impossible in in public sphere because of immediate attacks from uh, all sorts of. Uh, uh, opinion makers and uh, bots and, and and whatever and 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 it's and it's really unfortunate because uh, because Israel's war uh, shows that it's 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 one of the what one of the turning points of, of, of this year and uh, the, the left should have should have reflected more on this but uh, obviously the uh, the point is uh, that most of, of the Ukrainian left, except for some um, small groups, uh, agree on the solidarity with the uh, Palestinian people in in their suffering and uh, in support of uh, their right to uh, oppose colonial domination. But that, uh, unfortunately, is incomplete. Uh, it is a dots with the official position of, of the Ukrainian state. And uh, that position doesn't seem to be unmovable, although it's, it's a drastic departure from how Ukrainian for, foreign policy towards uh, Israel and Palestine developed in the previous years. But as I said, there is uh, almost no room for public discussion on that, on that question. And could you elaborate a little bit more on the, uh, because I have the second question from Chelsea on the Ukrainian government. How does the Ukrainian government uh, navigate in terms of diplomacy uh, in this context? Uh, for uh, geopolitical reasons, obviously the Ukrainian government aligned uh, with uh, Israel. And uh, Zelensky was uh, attempting to, uh, to 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 visit Israel and to show full support uh, for Netanyahu's government. And the uh, the official public discourse follows this. Um, the uh, patterns of war, Ukraine's voting in uh, in in the in the UN uh, is obvious. Um, the uh, uh, the discourse in civil society is mostly pro-Israeli, and that is connected to how uh, Ukraine's uh, mm, uh, defense against Russia is is imagined by uh, by the civil society and by the government. So, unfortunately, there is uh, there are no glimpses of like anything changes on this. 
Uh, Donna, would you like to intervene on this? Um, so I, I'm not 100% sure I, I understand the full question. Um, I mean, the position of the Ukrainian left, I think, is, is better all, ar articulated by someone that knows the, the space more. But um, the, that last part about grassroots solidarity and the pragmatic of sticky institutions and self-positioning in the global perspective. I mean, I think that what the person is asking is that, like, even if it may be a misunderstanding, but if there is solidarity that can be built and awareness and education around the Palestine question um, in the Ukrainian context, then how does that translate? Perhaps that's the question. Is how does that translate then to, to policy? And I linked in the chat an interesting article. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a you know an opinion article, but it does outline the fact that given Ukraine is uh, deeply interested in issues of territorial integrity, that they you know um, a more nuanced position on Israel Palestine is not actually outside the norm for the, the Ukrainian official position. That Ukraine the Ukraine's government does actually. Uh, uh, vote in the UN around these issues in a pretty, uh, 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 you know, not in, not in the worst way, you know, uh, uh, given some other comparisons. Um, so I think that there is something there in terms of um, this, this issue right now in Ukraine, this assault by Russia can help perhaps shift and create parallels. Not that, they, you know, not, I'm not claiming that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the same as Israel-Palestine. There's a lot of differences. But it can help maybe draw parallels for people, given that public opinion is discussing, um, you know, how important territorial integrity is, how important uh, um, these issues are, uh, and that they maybe there's more of an understanding, um, given the current climate, about what it means for a state to want to annihilate your national identity. And that th these are the parallels that can be drawn, perhaps, for um, to then translate into uh, official policy more more uh, readily. But yeah, I'm not sure if I answered the question because I don't know if I fully understood it. Uh, thanks a lot. I think you answered the question. And uh, as I uh, maybe I rem I don't remember it exactly, but one of the mm, um, uh, quotations I saw from. Um, um, uh, one of the representatives of the Ukrainian government regarding uh, this question is that when you are allied uh, and you are dependent on the Western uh, military aid, uh, the interests of your allies became, become your interests, but your interests, Ukrainian interests, doesn't become their interests. <laughs> so, um, uh, but this is the governmental and the state perspective, but for us, as for the uh, actors of civil society, I think there is uh, still some room um, for uh, for a change, uh, for a room for of uh, possibility to um, influence the public opinion. Unfortunately, we witnessed how uh, the media uh, function in Ukraine um, and these times, and how the Ukrainian public opinion is deeply. Um, misinformed <laughs> about uh, what is happening in, in Palestine, but um, and it, for us, it's it's also a very uh, specific position. But uh, fortunately, uh, we still have mechanisms, even in the times of war, to develop our own perspective and to make it visible. Um, of course, we will face uh, another. Uh, I think we will face another uh, DDoS attacks or this kind of stuff, but. Unfortunately, is we still have this possibility to publish our our journal to um, uh, de uh, to diffuse this information in social media, etc. Um, so I have another uh, question. Um, do the speakers see any possibility of ending the wars <laughs> and conflicts? Uh, such as Arab, Israeli, Russian, Ukrainian, and Taiwan, or are all these wars endless? And what should peace look like from the point of view of the left? Uh, so I think the question is about the peace prospects and the possible uh, possible solutions um, and possible um, yeah peace um, 
the vision of peace from from the left so um i don't know if somebody uh, feel like yeah dana please i mean because i see the arab israeli in there um so i don't think that like the reason we have had conflict arab israeli somewhat separate i mean related but somewhat a separate set of uh issues than the palestinian israeli so just to to distinguish those two things but the reason i think that maybe we have seen more normalization on the arab israeli front they're normalizing relations there's not there's not been conflict on that front in many decades versus the palestinian israeli continues to be an issue um is not because it's endless or it's because um there's no way to to articulate some sort of shared future um it's because the international community has empowered one side and completely sidelined and ignored the other side. We've seen this in US mediation efforts, whether it's the Oslo Accords, whether it's the Camp David you know, attempts in the, in the early 2000s, every, every intervention by the international community has not actually tried to solve the problem. They have tried to create a slightly less violent status quo um, or reapportion the violence so that only one side is really facing it and the other side can 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 uh, um, maybe build a more normal life uh, but the underlying issues are very clear the underlying issues are uh, um, the original expulsion of 1948 which created a refugee problem the continued expulsions around 1967 which created it exacerbated the refugee problem it's an issue of a lack of self-determination of the Palestinian people in the occupied territories it's an issue of an Israeli government and an international community that has allowed for the two-state solution to become uh, uh, no longer a possibility. And nobody has updated any of their approach to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in decades um, to, to, you know, to acknowledge that these changes have happened. And, and I think all of this comes from the fact that the international community has constantly ignored what Palestinians actually want. And what I mean by Palestinians, I don't, you know, they have no problem, you know, picking particular leadership and 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 negotiating around uh, uh, self-proclaimed leaders. But they they haven't done referendums with the Palestinian public. They haven't asked what the Palestinian public actually wants or needs to to sustain uh, 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 an end to the conflict. And I, I think that's the crux of it: is that like these negotiations have never been about resolving; they've been about maintaining certain status quo, and the Palestinian, like public opinion, has not been uh, involved in any sh in any way, shape, or form. And we know from previous examples around the world that that is possible. When the IRA and the British government in Northern Ireland were in negotiation, they had referendums. They had two referendums with the Irish people in Northern Ireland about whether or not they accepted the terms of the Good Friday Agreement. I don't understand why. I mean, I mean, I know why. It's because people in the global south are not included or or um, are not seen as as a valid participant in 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 uh, uh, you know their their environment. They're not allowed to have democratic participation in their environment. But I mean that's something that we need to discuss. So anyway, sorry, I, w I went off for a little bit a bit of a tangent. But the point is that I don't think that it's endless. I just think that we've never really had a serious attempt to resolve it, um, and that's why we're seeing these escalations in violence, these explosions. Thank you, Dana. Brian, please. Yeah, I mean, I think that we all believe that peace is possible and that war is not endless, otherwise we'd not be here. But uh, I think what we can look to is that there are these structural parallels. And so when you are a smaller polity caught between great powers, quote unquote, then your voice is not listened to. And international discourse is often only in terms of those great powers negotiating with each other about your fate without consulting what you think about your fate. And so in Taiwan's case, for example, uh, if there is a referendum on independence today and the results were something that China did not like, they would attack. And the U.S. also does not want a referendum on independence and has tried to undercut anyone who tried to push for that uh, politically because that would also cause regional disruption. And so then Taiwan's face is discussed in terms of the U.S. and China, irrespective of what the views of people here are. Uh, but moreover, I think what is quite alarming oftentimes to me is then there's a strange view, I think, particularly from the U.S., that, well, from the left, a self-flagellation, that you know, if we cut it out, 
if we don't back these people in Taiwan that just want their pro, you know, to maintain their democratic freedoms, then China will drop drop everything as well. And the it's a very uh, Western centric notion that you are the only prime mover in the world. Actually, the other side, if they if you stop it, they'll just stop it too. And that's not the case because great powers, there are those parallels, and they all I think want to expand their power in that way. And so then I think just looking at this, uh, it's very hard for us caught in between to really push for our own perspectives because that's the issue that between these great powers that they can just talk over us. And I think it's really necessary on the left to do that. And I think particularly people in imperial centers that can influence those great powers from within really have to be more cognizant of the need to then look at local voices and what they're saying, rather than also fall into that internalized great power mentality of just talking about peace processes without talking about the people that are actually directly in the line of fire. Because sure, we talk a lot now these days of a war between China and the US, but actually who would get attacked first? It'd be Taiwan. And I'm always alarmed that nobody talks about that, oftentimes in the US. Anyway. Thank you. Um... Uh, so we have a few minutes left. Uh, if you have, uh, so Chelsea and Velody, if you have some final words also on this question and maybe on uh, something which we didn't have possibility to discuss and you would like to touch upon, uh, please, um, Valodia, go on. Yeah, well, so yeah, I'm not qualified to talk about the other, the other cases. Uh, so... Um... In the case of the Russo-Ukrainian war, uh, so we have uh, a return of uh, mentions of a possible uh, ceasefire or uh, peace negotiations uh, and that comes increasingly more often from uh, the US, from some unnamed sources. Uh, it's also now mentioned by some Ukrainian politicians, and which is, which is new. Um, this is a incoherent response, right, to the uh, perceived stalemate uh, of the war. What is the uh, what is the likelihood of uh, this uh, of peace negotiations and the ceasefire? I think it's very low. Mm. Uh, if you uh, listen to what uh, Russian uh, politicians and uh, knowledgeable commentators say. Uh, the Russian ruling elite is quite confident it can win the war and the stakes are now perceived by them to be higher. Uh, they feel the opportunity, they feel uh, they have all the resources, they, their economy is increasing, so they will not go for negotiations. Uh, and uh, yeah, they will push for the, their, whatever they see as the final solution to the Ukraine question. So this war uh, is not going to going to end soon, uh, and uh, it's quite it still is quite volatile. As to the wars everywhere and so on, uh, yeah, I, I sort of, if my general like diagnosis is correct, they are going to increase. Uh, the the frequency of conflicts is going to increase, and uh, the left needs to think uh, needs to take account need need this perspective need to take account this perspective and to think very seriously about its own existence and functioning in times of increasing uh, increasing uh, hostilities uh, I think ahead of where they might might erupt next uh, the other important dimension which we shouldn't forget is the strategic strategic dimension the talks on uh, nuclear non-proliferation that uh, luckily seem to be renewing but at the same time the counter tendency is that russia keeps its uh, nuclear threat on simmering fire uh, that's that's another dimension that we should yeah that, that we should not uh, look away from thank you uh, chelsea your final word yeah uh, I agree with everyone. I'd like to continue Brian's point about Taiwan. Um, I don't think the Taiwan question will be over anytime soon. And it's important regionally in Asia because if you know, a armed conflict takes place, it will implicate most of Southeast Asia because uh, Taiwan is also a claimant uh, of various um, islands and, and maritime areas in the South China Sea. And Another reason why Taiwan question will go away anytime soon is because uh, 
the agenda of you know, liberating Taiwan in, in Beijing, it's not only a consensus within the party and the government, but also wider in the population. It's so national, nationalistically seared in the minds of most ordinary Chinese person that I personally, I don't see, I unfortunately, I see a very violent outcome out of that because it's an issue of um, you know, unrestrained nationalism that is also to some extent also nurtured by you know this wider geopolitical intensification around the world, like and growing insecurity um, in the United States as well as China. And, and also, I would like to continue Volodymyr's point about the Ukraine war. Yeah, there's been a lot of discussions and also more media coverage lately about how, you know, some segments in the Ukrainian government and also in the public of perhaps um, feeling that uh, that the tide is not being very favorable to Ukraine, um, given the new wars happening in the Middle East. Um, what I fear is that I see Ukraine in the same similar position as Vietnam during the Vietnam War in 1968, um, when it launched the military offensive called the Tet Offensive across southern Vietnam. Um, it was a military defeat for the communist forces, but it triggered such a shock impact politically across Western society, especially in the United States. You know, that's why you have this term, the 1968s. And some people not even comparing that to the Hamas massacre um, in on October 7th. Um, it, was a, it was a horrific crime, but it might, you know, ignite a you know, very transformative implication across societies, not just in the West, but also across the Middle East and Islamic world now. I, I personally, uh, throughout my career, I've not seen such popular rage um, being expressed by Gen Z, by young diplomats and activists across the Middle East and Islamic world as what's happening at the moment. And what I fear with Ukraine is that it will achieve an unjust peace because given the worsening situation in the Middle East and the Western powers focus on the Middle East, I fear the only condition that Russia will be willing to negotiate on is for the recognition of the four regions that it has um, occupied. I mean, it has, in, in, in Russia's own legal terms, they already recognized those regions as part of the Russian Federation. I mean, that alone makes any starting point for, uh, you know, for just negotiation very difficult for Ukraine. But you know, given you know, you no know, objective reports about you no know, difficulties with army recruitment, um, lack of adequate um, arms support and supplies from the West, etc. I think the tide is worsening, and also when you know leakages of rumors about you know, EU countries or NATO countries being increasingly less inclined to. Uh, fasten the process of admitting Ukraine to either the EU or NATO, um, it's very concerning. Well, me personally, I have feared from the very beginning that uh, even though the Ukraine has achieved a candidate status uh, in the EU admission process, what I fear is that not only will it be a very long process, maybe five to 10 years, I mean, for Serbia alone, which is a much smaller country, it took it, I think, 14 years I think next year is officially a EU member state. Um, and as for NATO membership, uh, as a security guarantee, um, I, personally, I don't think it will happen. And now the, the Washington DC and you know, other European capitals are flirting the idea of you know, non-NATO security guarantee for Ukraine, um, which personally, I don't trust either. Because I mean, what happened after 1994 is quite obvious and also following the Minsk agreement. So I think it's a point of retrospection for um, Ukrainian government and also the public, like what alternatives for its own security can be pursued? Because otherwise it will be trapped between the West and also Russia's uh, own maneuvers. So like the ex foreign minister of Ukraine said, uh, when we ally with the West, our interests are with the West, but West interests are not always with ours. And I think now it is manifesting itself um, increasingly.
So that's, yeah, that, that's yeah. largely correct. I, I would just add that Russia's ambitions are probably much larger than just this uh, next uh, regions that is described in the constitution. And that's my fear that uh, even the and just peace is not feasible uh, anytime in the future because uh, the odds are not in favor of uh, Russia stopping you in there. Uh, but uh, we'll see. But uh, largely, you're right in your analysis with the in, in relations between Ukraine and its allies. Thank you. Um, it was a wonderful discussion, and thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, so I cannot continue with the questions we have in the chat. Um, but I would like just to. Um, say the same thing that was said by uh, Simon Pirani in the chat, that uh, by holding such discussions, we are, I hope, uh, starting to address uh, the problems and it uh, gives us the basis uh, to um, share information and to develop our um, analysis. Um, so thanks a lot. Thanks for uh, to our participants and a huge thank you to our translators who uh, do a wonderful work in uh, uh, actually making the international solidarity practical. That means uh, uh, translating the perspectives of our the comrades in other countries to the Ukrainian audience and vice versa. Uh, our next session will start at um, uh, 6 p.m. Kiev time. Um, and it's called Women During the War between defense of the country and lack of social security. Um, thank you again. And um, I hope uh, we will continue this discussion. And it was a great pleasure. And let's not lose <laughs> uh, hope. Let's not lose optimism. Let's uh, stay a uh, pessimist in our reasoning, like realist in our reasoning, but um, uh, uh, optimist in um, uh, our uh, struggles. Uh, so have a nice evening. And for those who will join us for the next session, uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank all. you for the fascinating discussion. Thank you.